Hello and welcome. So I found this article on LinkedIn from Brian Chan on a very beginner friendly mean reversion trading strategy coded in Python. As you see he refers to Jim Simmons. So who is that? Jim Simmons to quantitative oriented people is basically the equivalent what Kim Kardashian is for fashion influencers. On a serious note, check out the guy, very interesting person. I will link this whole article, you don't need a LinkedIn account to read that. The idea of this video is we will construct the presented strategy, test it with new data, improve the code in general and also add some features to the strategy. Let's go to the trading results. Of course you should read the article before my coding part, I'm assuming all the knowledge covered here. So we was getting a total return or a cumulative return of 136%. So that's quite insane, right? Starting in 2019 and going until the mid of 2021. So without watching my video, do you think this performance will hold on with new data? Let's see. Alright, let's get started. First of all, we need some libraries. Why finance supports stock prices from the internet? Pandas for data handling, NumPy for calculation purposes, TA to calculate technical indicators and matplotlib to visualize our trading strategy. Next, we are going to pull price data for this symbol. So by the way, this is square, which was renamed to blog. So this is a a financial services company from the former Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey, right? Or Twitter founder rather. And we are starting at the exact same time as the author, right? So in the beginning of 2019. So of course we have more data than the author because his analysis ends in the mid of 2021, I think. So let's just see if the strategy is still working. With that, we are getting price data starting at the beginning of 2019 until today, right? So just daily price data here. Now we want to calculate some indicators. So I'm just doing the same as the author did. So I'm going to create a new column where I'm calculating the simple we average. So taking the close column, roll over that. Uh, with a 20 day window and take the mean. And I'm also doing that for the uh, rolling standard deviation. I'm calling that vol because I think it is not good to name the column as STD because STD is a pandas function, right? So if you don't believe me, you can check out the f.std, you will see bound method, data frame and so on, right? So by the way, this is just the standard deviation uh, formula, right? So I'm going to call that vol and roll over the close column and take the rolling standard deviation here. Also, we need the upper Bollinger Band. So we are just taking the MA20 and add two times the, uh, the volatility or the standard deviation to that. So this is the simple definition of uh, Bollinger Bands. So I've covered that in previous videos before if you want more details here. And for the lower Bollinger Band, we are just subtracting two times the standard deviation. All right. So with that, we are getting a, uh, some new columns here to our data frame. MA20, simple we average, vol, which is simply the rolling 20-day standard deviation at the upper low, uh, Bollinger Band and the lower Bollinger Band here. Right. So if you want to um, yeah, kind of see that visualized. You can just plot uh, the close, the moving average and the upper Bollinger Band and lower Bollinger Band. And then you will see it like this, right? So this is kind of a corridor. But as said, I've covered that in previous videos and he also described it in his article. So I'm not going much more into details here. Next, I'm going to calculate the RSI. So the author did this step by step and I actually did that, I think roughly two years ago in one of my videos where I showed how to calculate the RSI from scratch, right? Today, I'm just 
uh, yeah, I'm just lazy and use the use the TA library, take the momentum functions and take the RSI on the close and define the window as six as the author. And with that, I've defined my RSI. Now I'm again deviating from the author. So he was defining the signal um, by assigning the signal column. So he was creating a signal column and then assigning it two times. I'm showing you a pretty nice trick with yeah combination of NumPy and Pandas. So you can define an array of conditions. So first condition would be that the RSI is below 30 and also the close is below the lower Bollinger Band. So this is our first condition, right? And if that's the case, we want to buy, right? RSI is below 30 and the close is below the lower Bollinger Band. Second condition is RSI is above 70 and the close is above the upper Bollinger Band. Upper underscore, of course, Bollinger Band. So these are my conditions as an array or as a list rather here, right? Now I can define choices. And first is buy because these are my, or this is my buying condition, right? Or these two are my buying conditions. And second one, this here, is my selling condition. So, sorry for that, take a sell here. And now I can define a signal column, use NumPy select and pass the conditions and choices. And with that, I have my signal column containing a buy if the buy conditions are fulfilled and a sell if the sell conditions are fulfilled. Very nice if you work with multiple conditions, I can highly recommend to use this approach. So we have some NAN values, so let's get rid of them. And we have this wonderful uh, data frame here, right? So signal just once again, let's take a look at the tail of this data frame. So last 50 rows. So just in case you're asking yourself, why is this guy taking the last 50 rows? I'm simply screening for rows where I'm getting entries in the signal column. And here I'm lucky and I'm actually getting entries here, right? So we are getting a buy here when the buying conditions are fulfilled and a sell here when the selling conditions are fulfilled. All right. And next we are just going to loop over the rows, screen for the buys set a position flag so that we know that we are in a position and don't buy uh, the next uh, uh, row here if we have a situation like this and we are selling if we're in a position and so on so we will go through that step by step but before that i am doing what the author was doing because it's actually a pretty smart move he is shifting the signal uh, column by one row. So he has an easier time to just screen for the buy price. Because in this row, let's take this as an example. In this row, we are getting the signal, right? So the signal is occurring this row. And we can only buy on the next day's open, right? So the author is, by the way, um, buying on the next day's close, which doesn't make sense to me, but of course you can you can do that if you if that's your trading strategy. But for me, I would buy on the next day's open. But anyhow, he is shifting the signal row by or the, sorry the signal column by one row, and then can directly screen for the buy price. So in my case, I'm just taking the uh, next day's open here, right? So if imagine here I have my signal. If I'm shifting it. I directly have the buy price as my open price, okay? So I'm doing that as the author, good idea. Just assigning signal, DF signal and shift. So default shift is one, by the way, in case you are not aware of that. Now let's loop. So first of all, we are setting the position to false 
and we are defining some list where we are storing values. So by date, sell dates we need, empty list which we will populate, also buy prices and sell prices we will populate. This is our setup. Now, some of you asked me to cover iterose because it's a bit more efficient. As said, I'm not the biggest fan, but I got you covered, right? So iterose as I didn't cover it in any of my videos, how it is working. So iterose working like this. You're looping for index rows in a data frame and then iterose. And the index is simply the index of that data frame. And the row is simply the row of that data frame. You actually loop like this, sorry. So if I'm printing the index, I'm just getting the index of that data frame printed out here, right? Iteratively here. And also for the row. So if I'm printing the row, I'm getting every single row printed out here, right? So this very first row is exactly the same as taking this here. So let's uh, remember 72.26 here will be the first iteration. So 72.26. All right, so this is how iterose is working. Okay, so we are looping for index row in df.iterose. And now we are, first of all, for a buying signal, we need to not be in a position where that, that's very bad English, <laughs> sorry. We have to be out of a position so to, to buy an asset, right? So we are checking if not position and then we are taking the row and screen for the signal and check if that's a buying signal. So again, if we're not in position and we have a buying signal, we wanna buy, buy this asset, right? So we are appending to our buy dates uh, list and our buying date is simply the index and our buy prices very straightforward is simply the open and we can do that because we shifted the signal column by one row right so we are just screening uh, the open price here and after that we have to set the position to true as we are in a position now and then same condition so if we are in a position and my signal is sell, then I want to do what I did. So same logic as I did here for the buying uh, dates and prices. So I'm just appending the index to the sell dates and the row open to the sell prices and also set the position to false. Okay, so again, this is just looping over every single row in this data frame and checks if we are in a position. So the initial position is false. If we're not in position and we are getting a buying signal, we are pending the buy dates and set the position value to true. So we are looping over the next rows and until we are getting a sell signal, and then we are just uh, selling and set the position to false so that we can buy after we've sold the asset. So we can buy again after we've sold the asset. Okay, so let's execute that. And with that, we've populated all our lists here, right? Buy dates, sell dates, buy prices, and sell prices. Okay. So let's visualize that strategy. That's pretty much straightforward. We are plotting the close. Um, and yeah, we are scatter plotting the buying and selling flags. So I'm just screening the data frame for my buy dates and take a look at the index and then set my buy flag uh, to the buy dates close here and then setting the marker to this one here and set the color to green. So I've covered that many previous videos. I'm not getting into details what I'm doing here. I just want to create a chart which is containing like green and red flags. Um, green flag when I have a buying signal and red flag when I have a selling signal. 
So here I'm screening for my cell dates and here for the close of the cell dates. So why am I taking close here? You can also take your buy price here, but I, I just wanna set the buy flag on the close because I'm also plotting the close here, right? So I hope this makes sense to you. I'm executing that. And then you, you notice that I messed up because I set the exact same markers. So of course we have to do a distinction here. So this is a cell value and now you see this. This looks quite similar to the author's uh, chart, but the author's chart was ending here, right? Somewhere here, so somewhere mid-end of um, 2021. And you see, how this trade didn't work out. Here's the selling signal, right? So let me enlarge that a bit. PLT figure, figure size 10.5, it's that enough, yeah. So you see here, right? Yeah, this is a very bad trade and this is also a very bad trade and without having a look at the profits yet, I can tell you that this is crushing the whole strategy until until here, right? But uh, let's find that out actually. So, well, we are just taking our um, sell prices, subtract our buy prices, and then set it into relation to our buy prices, right? With that, we have calculated our relative return per each of those trades here, right? So let's do that with the list comprehension by Mean, minus, uh, of course, sell minus buy, not buy minus sell. So this is your absolute profit, right? You are taking your sell price, subtract your buy price, and then you have a profit or a loss, depends on how your trade work out. And then you're setting that into relation to your buy. For sell buy in zip sell prices, buy prices. So with that, we are getting our profits and you see the last two trades here, as I said, right? Totally crushing it here. So yeah, we can transform this list to a series and apply pandas methods. So I wanna have the overall returns. So these are just the returns per trade, but I wanna accumulate those returns here. So I'm transforming that to a series. Um, yeah, add a one to that serious and take the product so this is simply accumulating returns and you see you see we made like 15 percent losses right so if you want to see the return you see 14 percent losses we made with this strategy right so this strategy was working very good and was yielding high returns until the end of the analysis of this offer well, the author said this strategy can be improved by setting stop losses. And now for me, the interesting question would be, okay, would those stop losses mm, make this strategy, so with the new data flowing in, better? And we will also cover that. I think that's quite an interesting uh, thing to, to check out. So how am I going to do that? So I'm going to shift the close column by one row. And I'm going to explain to you in some seconds why I'm doing that. So first of all, I'm shift, shifting the close and call that shifted close. So I'm using the close and shift that by one row. And now I'm amending the loop. So I've shifted that, very important. And now I'm amending if I'm in a position and now I'm checking two things. First, if my row signal is sell or, and now we are getting to the stop loss condition, the row and then the shifted close because this is the close one row before, right? And one row before I have to take because I'm buying in the current row, right? 
And if I wouldn't shift the close, that would give me wrong values here, right? So I have to take the close from the day before and check if that is below. And now, I mean, you have to define a stop loss threshold, right? I'm just taking 5% here. So I'm taking 95% uh, of the last buy price. So I'm screening my buy prices list and just consider the last element here. Okay, so this is how you could add a stop loss to this strategy. So let's execute that again and actually not mess up as I did and do the right indentations. Let's execute that. Everything went through and now plot the strategy again. And now you see that we are avoiding some losses here, right? So we are getting slightly more trades here because we are not in a position here anymore and uh, new trades are uh, triggering here. But let's take a look at if that would be better. So I'm just executing this line again. So this is the cumulative return of the strategy. And you see, we actually made 24% profit, which is, of course, way worse than the author um, was, was doing, or not the author, but the strategy was performing until his end of analysis, mid of 2021. But at least that is better than the negative return here, right? Of course, you can play a bit around here, right? So take 98%, quite similar results, take 10%, bad and so on, right? So you can play around uh, with that for yourself. But yeah, quite interesting. So um, of course, what you could do is test that out for other assets. So let's actually do that. Let's do that for some fancy assets like Apple. Just execute everything again. Yeah, let's keep the stop loss here. Yeah, of course, I messed up here because I took this not before this that has to be done before and then i see it for apple let's take a look at the cumulative return yeah this is quite quite bad right so maybe we could take 10 percent stop loss got 22 percent but hmm not that convincing right apple didn't uh, crash as much as square so my um, yeah hypothesis would be that this would work better without a stop loss so let's actually test that so i'm just going to comment that out here execute that again and take a look at the return yeah we're getting 39 percent return here okay so yeah, that's already it. Thank you very much for watching. What could be covered in future videos is testing that on a larger scale, right? So passing hundreds of assets, be it stocks, cryptocurrencies, Forex, and so on. Building that strategy with the backtesting library and so on. So just let me know what you would be interested in. And again, thanks for watching and I'm looking forward to see you in the upcoming videos. Bye bye.